Welcome back to Think Tech. Here we are in Honolulu doing community matters on a given Thursday. And we have a special guest from California. Uh, he is a human resources guru, if you don't mind me saying that. That's uh, Rex Connor. Welcome to the show, Rex. Thank you, Jane. Glad to be here. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about your book uh, today. I'd like to talk about human resources. I'd like to talk about the millennials in the workplace and how to create a workplace that engages people and gives them gratification and um, you know has, makes maximum productivity. So let's start first about your book. Tell us about your book. Well, the book's called What If Common Sense Was Common Practice in Business? And I tried to make it an easy read. There are Dilbert comics in it, because Dilbert uh, points out the fact, if you're familiar with those comics, that we just violate common sense all of the time in the workplace. And so my hope with the book is that people will feel validated that, you know, this, this really is messed up. And I want it to give them hope that I can do something about it. Yeah, that would be great. And I think uh, a lot of people don't know. They just cruise through it and try to go by the seat of their pants without thinking of the, the basic principles. So let's talk about how the workplace has changed in the last 10 years. Because 10 years ago, there were no millennials. But now we have millennials, and maybe in some ways, they are the most important people in the workplace. They are the ones you want to hold on to. Uh, at the same time, they want to leave. They always want to go from gig to gig. So, <laughs> you know, what's the workplace like? Let's let's address that first. Well, statistically, they are they do like to change jobs. I don't think they're different creatures from from uh, the rest of the humanoids on the planet. What they want isn't a lot different than what all of us want. They're just more likely to seeing take this job and shove it and move on, take their talents elsewhere than maybe their older counterparts. You know, my generation grew up trying to stay with a company for a long time. They don't have that same same value, uh, that certainly doesn't make them any less valuable. We certainly want to retain the people that have the skills to do the job, and a lot of times that's millennials. I have a couple of millennials working for me. But doesn't that reflect the, 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 the notion, of the, you know, the move on uh, philosophy, the move on approach? Doesn't it reflect the notion of a lack of loyalty? Uh, you know, in earlier generations, maybe mine, yours, uh, for one reason or another, maybe it was sometimes you know, more than spiritual, more than philosophical, but um, at least in those days, it seems like to me there was a great amount of loyalty. Um, maybe is loyalty changed now? Maybe what has changed is the millennials look at us, um, their parents, and they say, you know what, loyalty goes both ways. The company needs to be loyal to the to the employee as well as the other way around. And you, know, you see changes in things like retirement plans, where back in the day, a lot of retirement plans were, well, if you stick with us for 20 years, we'll pay you a certain amount of money. And now we've gone to the fixed, um, from fixed benefit to just, okay, well, if you contribute to it, when you leave, you can take the money with you. That's a subtle shift, but it, it's an example of Maybe that maybe millennials are looking at it saying, well, companies aren't loyal to me. Why do I owe them owe them loyalty if they aren't loyal to me? It can so that can go both ways. Yeah. Well, so when when you have a millennial, I don't want to distinguish them in all capacities, but when you have them, what what do you what do you do to treat them special? What do you do to treat them, um, you know, in a way so that they you can achieve this mutual loyalty you're just talking about? Well, I don't, that's where I think millennials aren't completely different in what they're looking for. All of us want to feel like we're contributing to the job. All of us feel like, um, want to feel like we're being valued. And where that falls short in the job, not just for millennials, but for all of us, is when I'm, I'm part of a subjective process, when my evaluations are subjective. You know, they're open to interpretation, and I interpret them differently than the boss. You know the boss is going to win. <laughs> and so regardless of what generation you're in, you don't like that, um, that subjectivity in the work processes. So if you can take the subjectivity out of the work processes so everyone knows, for example, how you're going to be evaluated, exactly what the job's supposed to be, exactly what the outcome should be, how I'm going to get paid, how I qualify for pay raises, 
that's going to go a long way to retaining not only millennials, but all of us. Yeah, to make it objective instead of subjective. You know, it comes to mind exactly. when, you, when you talk about that. Um, I had a case, um, actually a reporting job, um, in which involved a, a naval investigation of an accident at sea. And it was a nuclear submarine involved. And, and one of the issues was whether the captain of the submarine had created a, a, a work environment in the control room uh, of the submarine that was appropriate and, and was not likely to result in accidents. In this case, it was a horrendous accident. Um, and one of, the, one of the points that the Board of Investigation took upon when they investigated this and what they found in the result of their investigation was that the captain had not achieved a, a climate, uh, a collaborative climate. Um, and that means that the individuals in the control room should be listened to, should be uh, heard, and uh, that, that the captain should have been asking them for their opinion, should have been taking their advice or at least considering their advice. Uh, and he didn't do that. It was a, you know, it was a vertical, uh, a vertical kind of arrangement instead of a horizontal one. And you can't afford that in a mission critical control room. And I wonder if that kind of thing is relevant to what you're talking about. You know, Jay, I think it really is. I, that's, uh, of course, an extreme example when you're talking about a nuclear submarine and people's lives that are under the water. That, that's a job that a lot of us wouldn't, uh, wouldn't relish. And of course, the, the results of errors there are much more dramatic than they are in, in my workplace. You bet. But the concept, like you're saying, Jay, is, it is the same. Everyone needs to be able to communicate clearly, especially in their area of expertise. And I run a small company. I don't have expertise in all the areas of my company. And so I have people that are a lot smarter than me in a lot of different areas. And even if I've done that job before, even if I have expertise in that area, someone that's current in it, I need to listen to them. Most importantly, the communication needs to be clear enough where they can feel safe in clarifying my fuzzy direction, my fuzzy uh, terminology. Terminology. My yeah. subjective, subjective Well, that, that's exactly what happened in the nuclear submarine. Uh, the individuals, the crew members in the uh, in the command in the control uh, room, um, were not. I mean, in fact, by virtue of a, a third party investigation, they were not. They did not feel free to communicate their concern about this, that, or the other thing. And as a result, the captain was was doing his own thinking alone. Um, and of course, you know what it suggests is you've got to communicate to your crew that they're free, in fact, more than free, they, to save everyone's life, they have an obligation to talk to you, uh, to tell you that you may be wrong, uh, to tell you that you may want to consider other factors. And I think that probably goes in a lot of businesses. Um, it's not that uh, they don't want to, it's that you have to affirmatively encourage them to do that. You have to teach them to do that. And this goes to, uh, I know a part of your book is about training. Uh, so how do you train people to speak up, to provide their input, to make, to watch your back for you, to watch your back? That's what happened here. They didn't watch his back. I'm not sure that's a training issue as much as it's a trust issue, and I don't know that you can, that you need to train that. That's a, trusting is a skill we all have when we choose to, to award it to someone. So it's really a, a matter of clarifying what everyone's roles are and what the communication is. And it's really creating the environment. And you're right, Jay, this is a top-down requirement. It's creating an environment where it's safe to clarify communication. And that's what people need. They just need to know that when something is open to interpretation, I, need, I am safe to ask for clarification. There is a process you can use to do that, but part of it is you have to be safe to do it. I know I've, I've had situations where I tried to clarify with my boss some directive they've given me, and those conversations did not end well. <laughs> well, in this case, they didn't end well either. There was loss of right. life involved. But, you know, I, I just wonder then, um, okay, so it may not be involved in a specific training, but how important is the training? I understand you've got to have a language 
a language of communication. And from the top down, you've got to talk in certain terms and certain lingo so that there's no ambiguity. You, you know, you want it to be very clear what you mean and, and how you feel about them and how you want them to feel about you. Um, but w how does that wrap around in the training aspect? Well, training is, is just one part of the equation, but the bottom line principles are the same. In training, you need to take out all the subjectivity. That's been done in the training realm very effectively by the pioneers of the performance-based training that is so prevalent today. And I happen to uh, represent the, the products and the work of one of those pioneers, Dr. Robert Mager. And the real secret sauce in his methodology is to take all of that ambiguity, all that subjectivity out of training and to make sure it's completely clear that language you're talking about, Jay, we call a common performance language where everyone talks about the way humans perform, they talk about it in very clear, observable performances. They don't use what he calls fuzzies or fuzzy language like, you need to be a team player. You need to take some initiative. You need to have business acumen. Those are all fuzzies and you can translate, there's a way to translate those fuzzies into observable performances. That same language can spread from training to the recruiting process, to the business business processes, especially the evaluations on the, in the business units. Well, may I ask you for some examples of that? Because, um, you know, there are a lot of mm, standard phrases that people use, I recognize that. And uh, they feel that these phrases, you know, the, the, the boss feels that these phrases um, connote, um, you know, the right principles. But I agree, you've got to be, you've got to have examples, you've got to be detailed, um, you've got to find a way to actually communicate what's on your mind uh, so that the other fellow understands what you're really thinking. So give us some examples of how you would, you know, how you would flesh out the notion of you've got to be a team player. What would you say? Let me give you a, a very personal example, but I hope what's happening during this is all your viewers are saying, oh, I've been in that situation, and they're, they're <laughs> reviewing their own example. But uh, the aforementioned conversation with a boss that didn't go well was when a boss brought me in for my annual evaluation. And I was expecting to, you know, to have praises heaped on me because of what I was doing is saving the company millions of dollars. He said, I'm giving you the minimum raise I can because you just aren't a team player. I said, how am I not a team player? I, I recruited the team, I trained the team, I you know, I implement, I work with the team, how am I not a team player? He said, well, that's my team now. I said, well, of course it's your team, you're the boss, but how am I not a team player? And then I, then I realized this process I mentioned to translate uh, fuzzy communication. I said, fair enough, boss, but when I'm being a team player, what are you observing me do? And he, he, this conversation started out pretty well. He said, well, first of all, you're coming to team meetings on time. I said, fair enough. Second of all, you aren't rolling your eyes when your team members speak. I said, okay, yeah, fair enough. What else, boss? And at this point, he started getting defensive, like I'm trying to um, pin him down and argue against him. And that's why this process, while it's a simple and a good process, it still takes tact timing diplomacy that maybe I didn't have at the time. And he just kind of dismissed me with, well, that's enough. You should know when you're a team player or not. And so that particular instance, maybe I shouldn't use a bad example, but that one didn't end well. Um, but the idea is- <laughs> that Was that the end of your job? Uh, basically, it was. I was forced out of that job. That was the oh, beginning goodness. of the forced out of the job. So, sorry to use a bad example, but it's a clear example. Of, I never found out what being a team player meant to the boss, and that's why I was I was uh, making the point earlier in the submarine example. That conversation, you have to be safe to have that conversation. It needs to be allowed. It needs to be part of the culture. So a boss cannot feel threatened. They can say, oh, yeah, you're right. I need to communicate this more clearly. Let me give you some more observable performances to describe what I'm talking about. That's but, the goal of clarifying communication. 
Yeah, let me, let me take that a step further and say, suppose the individual, not you, but somebody in your shoes in that circumstance, actually didn't like the boss, actually was a negative person, actually was a terrible employee. And, you know, and we, you know, there are those around. That's always going to be the human condition. Um, so, you know, you can, you can say, I want you to tell me, I want you to show me, I want you to, you know, talk, talk back to me, I want that. And then that can be, that can lead to a problem of another kind, can it? Certainly. Certainly. There, in the human experience, there are all sorts of minefields, especially in this area of trying to clarify communication with people that aren't used to it or people that don't want to. What I actually did, and it helped for a little while in this case, is I went to a coworker who the boss really liked. They spoke the same language. I spoke a different language. And I used this coworker as a translator between me and the boss. I said, you know, the boss says I'm not a team player. What's the boss saying? What should I be doing that's observable? And she straightened me out quite a bit. Well, you do this, this, and this. He hates that kind of stuff. I didn't recognize I was doing it. It was part of me. And so um, it helps sometimes to have a, a translator in the work. Yeah, sure. But at the, at, the, at the end of the day, you want to have a personal relationship with everyone. You, you know, I remember there was one CEO here in Honolulu. He knew the, the name of every employee in the company, and it was a big company. He knew the name of every wife of every employee, and furthermore, he prided himself on naming the name of the dog of each employee, if there was one, or the children. I notice I mentioned dogs first. Uh, <laughs> But how important is it to have a familiarity type relationship uh, with the people involved? Jay, don't we all know as a common sense that business is all about people? It's all about relationships. That is common sense. That's why we all scratch our heads when we work for a dictator or we work for someone that um, doesn't care about people or those people get promoted to people positions. And I'm not saying those people are bad. There are a lot of people that don't want to deal with people. Let them deal with what they enjoy dealing with. I have a person in my own company that does not want to deal with customer service because she doesn't like it and she knows she's terrible at it. And she says, don't put me in a customer service. Don't put me in a role where I have to pacify a customer. I will not do it. Yeah. So let's get the people in the position. But going back to your point, it is all about relationships. Yeah. But you know, what strikes me from what you say is that sometimes the, the, uh, it's a round peg in a square hole. In other words, the person was uh, hired, engaged to do one job, but we all find out going down the path that maybe that's not the best job for that person um, in terms of skill or aptitude, in terms of taste, what, what have you. There's no accounting for taste. And then you're in a, in a moment of trying to figure out how to improve that situation. And I suppose you can change the job. Uh, or I suppose you can change the person with some other person. Um, you know, in a small company, you've got to get the job done somehow. What do you do when you run into uh, an employee who's a square, or a contractor who's a square peg in a round hole? Um, how do you alleviate that problem and still get the job done? Boy, Jay, and that's so critical for small companies because you don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of resources. I, I faced that in my small company uh, recently. I had, um, you know, a man, bless his heart, very talented in the, in the field he was in, and I thought that translated by job title to the position I put him in in my company, and it did by job title. It did not translate by skill. And we spent a lot of time, and frankly, that was a lot of money, trying to find the right skill set that he had that could contribute to the business. And eventually he opted out and I use him as a contractor now for very specific skills that he has. But he's no longer in the position that he was in. That's just the reality of business. It uh, ties in real well. I appreciate the segue to the subtitle in my book. Don't expect fish to climb trees. Don't hire someone to do a job <laughs> And I never knew it. You know, that, <laughs> that comes from that quote that we all love Albert Einstein quotes. And his quote was everybody's a genius, but when you evaluate a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its whole life thinking that it's stupid. 
And so my book has a whole chapter on how do you fit a, the job requirements with a person's skill set and how do you avoid mismatching those because we've all seen the results of mismatching just like my example and I wrote the book and made that mistake <laughs> of not matching not matching the skill in my hurry in a small business get someone in here the job title sounds the same that was all a violation of chapter two of my book <laughs> Let's talk about job titles. You mentioned that. Job titles are very important for, you know, everybody understanding what the name of the game is and maybe gratification too. It's a, it's a, it's a stroke for sure. Uh, or maybe the other side, it's, a, it's a, a problem if you use the wrong job title. So have you got any advice about how to select a job title and interestingly enough, how to change a job title? Um, since I run the business, I have the purview of changing, which I do liberally, and I, I use job titles just the way you said, Jay. Um, sometimes the person, that's important to them. And the person I hired recently to take the place of the baby boomer that I mentioned, she's a millennial, and she was all about the job title. I said, well, what job title do you want? And she gave me one, you know, her highness of something, and I said, well, let's choose one that will communicate to our clients what you do. So it's really a negotiation between, I think, between, first of all, I don't limit myself to the traditional job structures or titles, but I want the right combination that honors the skills that, that the person has while communicating to my clients, to my target population, not the entire world, just to my clients, what they can expect from that job position, from that person that has that position. So really it's a negotiation. Yeah. Very interesting. That, you know, some, some of these uh, tech companies, the entrepreneurial companies, they come up with job titles you never heard before. Chief, chief thinker <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And, and I mean, I it's, like, it's, it's very personal. Yeah. See? Mm -hmm. It is. And my, you know, I had the title lead partner. Uh, um, I own the company. I co-founded it, but the other person isn't an active member of the company. You know, a lot of people call that position CEO or president. Whatever, I like lead partner because that's what I want everyone in my organization to feel like. I want them all to feel like partners. And I encourage them to have partner in their title too, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, not all of them do, but uh, I like it to be descriptive. Yeah, it's part of the culture. For yeah. your, so I like creativity yeah. in the job. Well, creativity is, is a great culture to have because creativity goes down a path toward engaging people. And engaging people means they're more productive. Um, you know, I, I wanted to talk, talk about uh, productivity. You know, we've had a lot of talk here in Honolulu. We've had a number of uh, programs and events lately about um, not necessarily about the millennials or limited to the millennials, but about the um, you know the senior crowd. And uh, there are people in the community, and in fact, in positions of official power, who would like to see more. Elders hired after retirement, brought back into the workforce. And I wonder if you have any advice on how to deal with them. Uh, is it a good idea? Do you have to deal with them differently? How do you compare dealing with a millennial and dealing with an elder senior person? Yes, I do have some advice. It may not be what you're looking for <laughs> or popular. Go, go for it. <laughs> um, I, I, in my business, and this is why I recommend to others, I don't care if they're young, old, black, white, male, female, their sexual preference. I don't hire activists for their particular situation. I think we should do the hiring by skills and matching the skills that the job requires with the skills of the person. In the middle and long term, that works out best. And senior people have a tremendous amount of skills, especially if you look at the entirety of a job. You know, we say that, well, millennials have the technology background. They'll learn the technology quickly. Very true. And we need, we need those skills, too. But let's not forget all the soft skills, all the people skills. Because we just said, Jay, that business is about relationships. It's about people. Good heavens, there are a lot of senior people that have some very um, rich experience in relationships that millennials don't have. I, w I wish I could remember the name of the movie. I'm sorry, I can't, but recently, I think it was The Intern with, um, anyway, an older guy goes in the workplace with all these millennials. You know, at first, no one wants to work with him because he's old, he doesn't have the same skill set. 
but he has so much experience, so much wisdom with people. Pretty soon, everyone wants him. Yeah. Wants his advice. Yeah. So let's let's just broaden our expectations to include soft skills and people skills, and then get the right person in that job that has the right combination. Yeah, I certainly agree. And I I practiced law for a long time, and I tell you that in the law firm I was involved, um, we found that somebody with life experience was valuable, if for no other reason than the life experience. It's that sense of judgment, that sense of um, dealing with dealing with situations, but let me ask you this: you know, training. And training is an underscore here because you you you, you like skills, but but many times um, you you can't find someone with the exact skill you want. So you have to put that in focus with training. You have to bring whoever it is into the specific you know skill that you need for your company. And I wonder what role training plays, how you organize it, how, how, you, mm, how you put it in the daily schedule, and how you treat the, the notion of cross-training, uh, training a little broader than you might, you know, so somebody is doing job A, somebody doing job B, but you give training that actually teaches B about what A is doing. Do you do that? What's the, what's the benefit, what's the detriment of training? And how much, I know this is multiple compound question, how much training do you want to give? How much time do you want to spend on training when you still have the job to do? That is a good way to ask the question. How much training when you still have a job to do? And in what I'm recommending to people, I'm recommending you don't isolate training, you don't isolate recruiting, and you don't isolate employee development. It's all the same subject. It should be part of one seamless people performance system built on the same skills that you identified when you built a performance-based job description. And so training's near and dear to my heart, but you can't, if you keep it isolated in the stovepipes of recruiting, training, development, you will never get the full impact. You'll never answer the question you're asking about how much training do you do. You do exactly what's required by your people performance system. And part of that is developing people for new jobs. It's career mapping. It's succession planning. Mm, yeah. It's all the same subject. If you start out by identifying what a competent performer does in the workplace for each job and you build performance objectives around all of that for all the job descriptions, you have a map that's available to everyone to say what skills each position needs. So if you're interested in a new position or grooming someone for a new position, you know exactly what skills they need to develop and can include that in their development plan. But you've hired the right person for a job for those skills, you train the exact skills you need for that job, you identify, um, you evaluate based on those skills. It's all one system. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, in my experience, you bring someone from the outside in and you, you hire an official trainer. And you have this trainer stand at the head of the class with a PowerPoint and a blackboard and train as if you were in school, back in school. Sometimes, and in my law firm, this was really, you know, what we did most of the time, if not all the time, we had somebody in the group, some lawyer, some staff person, um, some administrative person, would, would stand up in-house, in-house training and share what that person was doing with everyone else. So everyone knew what that person was doing, everyone learned the lessons that person had learned, even if they were hard lessons. Um, and that person had the chance to express himself or herself and feel good about it. So it was all a win, 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 win. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, what, where you make that choice, at least in your view, whether to train in-house or hire somebody to come from outside and train. Well, people, in, I've been around the, the training industry now for more than 20 years, and what you described is a subject matter expert running the training. And the acronym, of course, is SME or SME. That's a common, common phrase. And what you described is subjected to SME disease. Where the SME gets up gives a lot of information. What I recommend is what my mentor, Dr. Robert Mager, that I mentioned before, his focus in this whole people-human performance 
um, arena, his focus is on performance-based training. And that is based on training in Magerville, <laughs> where he resides. Training means a new skill. It doesn't mean information. And so there is a scientific way. Mager was a scientist. He came into the corporate training realm and looked around and said, you people are messed up. You're trying to do training like they do in school, where you dump a lot of information on someone and hope that somewhere, someday, they'll be able to apply it. He said, that's not how the human brain works. That's not science. The scientific way to do this is to go out on the job, evaluate what a competent performer does, and build backwards like reverse engineering, and make sure in the training environment they're developing those specific skills and that they are demonstrating those skills before they leave training so when they get on the job they can perform on day one. And I'll tell you, Jay, um, being in more than 50 companies in the last couple of decades, uh, that's not common practice. I, I hope when I said it, it sounds like common sense, but it's not common practice. Um, but there's a method of doing, of doing it. When you do it, the results are spectacular. They aren't good. They aren't better than average. The results are spectacular. Good advice. So I'm a proponent of this performance-based training. Good advice. Uh, Rex Connor, a, um, a human resources uh, guru, written a book and has uh, given us some good advice today. Thank you so much, Rex, for appearing on ThinkTech on Community Matters. We hope to talk to you again soon. And as you said, it's all about common sense. Aloha. Thank you.